Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Jazz Standard here in New York City. Tenor saxophonist Houston Person came in a class during the late 1960s that introduced the world to soul jazz, where it fused both blues, straight ahead jazz, and R&B to jazz fans all over the world. talk about growing up in South Carolina. You grew up in the church, but throughout your musical career and even today, a lot of your music has a lot of soul jazz slash blues. Tell me how you got exposed to blues. Oh, it was just, it was all around me on the jukeboxes. When I had jukeboxes and radio, uh, everybody played the blues. Uh, and uh, it wasn't so divided as it is now. You had blues bands that had jazz musicians in them, and it was just music. You know, we didn't uh, didn't necessarily use categories as much as they do now. You got to, you know, all kind of categories, but it's all just music to me. You started off playing piano, but. You segued into playing saxophone. How did you decide that the tenor was what you really wanted to play? Uh, I don't know. Well, I, music was always in my family, you know, church choir. And I played, uh, practiced the piano every day and listening to radio and hearing all the great music. And I don't know, I just kind of got to the saxophone. Well, first thing is um, my parents gave me a saxophone. That's how I really got interested. Then I saw... Um, Heard all the great guys, Illinois Jacket, Johnny Griffin, Sil Austin, and Sam Taylor, all those guys. So uh, and then I got into it, and Earl Bostick, a lot of guys, you know. So I gravitated toward saxophone. Talk about your time coming to New York and jumping into the New York jazz and music scene. It had to be a very, very helter skelter because the music was changing. And then you were also trying to find your way here and accompany a lot of artists. Yeah, well, I just, all through my career, I've just tried to be myself, what I am. And I'm a mixture of what I heard in the South from country and western to opera to um, jazz to rhythm and blues, blues, gospel music, all that I try to bring in my music. And you have done that successfully. You came out at a time in a class where a lot of musicians were changing the game of jazz. It was you. Pat Martino, George Benson, Idris Mohammed, Charles Arlen. Soul jazz was starting to, to, to take over the, the airways and also the clubs. Why was that during the late 60s? Well, it's still based on the blues. The blues is uh, 
close to people's heart and it was and we still were associated with dance um, it's been one of my gripes I you know people like to dance and we were giving them dance music too so it was good listening music and good dance music so that was a lot of the success of that was and you could have fun with it you didn't have to bring a textbook with you when you heard that stuff <laughs> career really took off the partnership of Bob Weinstock and Prestige Records. Tell me about your time with Bob Weinstock as well as Rudy Van Gelder at Van Gelder Studios because the sound of those records that you made were a little different than a lot of the other jazz recordings that came out at the time. Well Bob Weinstock, I give him all the credit because he stuck with me. He, he really did. He kept bringing me back, bringing me back, and he must have known something. So <laughs> we, uh, I thank him very much, and we remain friends over the years. And um, Rudy has been, uh, well, I call him, he's my producer. <laughs> I produce my records, but uh, Rudy has really helped me immensely. I can't tell you how much he's helped me uh, through the years. And we've done tons of records together. Bob Porter, also your producer, too, he, he was very instrumental. What was it that he, he wanted you guys to bring to the table late 1966, 67, and 68? Because Black Talk was a record that catapulted you and Charles Erland's career to monumental success. Yeah, well, Bob always had uh, a feeling for the blues. And when you put all the common denominators in there, it's still the blues. And uh, he always uh, gave you the opportunity to play the blues. And those who forgot, he just reminded them, hey, let's put the blues on here. So... Uh, Bob, and you know he has a successful blues show on um, uh, public radio. So um, he's been, that's his thing. And he had, you know, Melvin Sparks, uh, Leon Spencer, a bunch of us. And we just knew how to, knew what to deliver. And radio played you guys a, a great deal. Even some R&B stations and soul stations at the time were playing Black Talk and even your debut record. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got a lot of play on all those stations. Uh, I remember my first interview ever was with, with Dell Shields over at uh, WLIB. It was LIB then. Um, and it got a lot of... Uh, a lot of play, and I enjoyed that too, because uh, they had a lot of uh, the R&B stations. Uh, you got around and meet, met those guys, and and you got a good idea of the pulse of the public people, and you know, the, the, everybody was street then. You know, 
you knew what was happening on the street. And that's the way, that's what kept it going was, it was like street music. <laughs> association with Adder Jones was almost 40 years. And a lot of people thought you guys were married, but you guys weren't married. You guys yeah. were just musical partners. Yeah. Explain the first time you met Adder and how did you guys develop into that almost 40 year partnership? Oh, well, we were, um, I met her in Harlem uh, one night up at Wells Restaurant. And then we didn't see each other again for a while. And um, I got a job and they wanted a vocalist. We'd bring a vocalist with us and we worked together. We didn't see each other for a while. And then um, I got another job and I took her with me. And um, it just eventually, one day I got a job and I didn't take her. And she asked me, well, what? what What's wrong? I said, nothing. She said, well, you know, you take me on all the gigs. Take me on all of them. So that, so she became a part of the band. <laughs> so, so she started working, and we evolved into that nice uh, partnership for ages. And, um, but um, that was the way it started was she, because I always wanted a band with a vocalist anyway. And she was a vocalist that didn't have a band, so it was kind of perfect for us. So um, she became a part of the group. What was Etta's whole flavor? What what did she bring to the whole jazz female vocalist versus Ella Fitzgerald or Irene Krall or um, Dinah Washington? What was it that differentiated her from all the other jazz vocalists? You know, I've never really put my hand on it. It was just that she had a unique quality that was her. And with most of the singers you just called, or vocalists you just uh, called out, they had that unique quality and um, to communicate to people. And had great respect f for the lyrics. And that was every one of these people that you're talking about. So. Um, that's all I can say is she had a, a unique uh, uh, quality and she was a nice person and no ego. Just sang it straight down. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at the Jazz Standard. I'd like to personally thank Houston Person for his time as well as the staff here at the Jazz Standard. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Peace.